Um, well, you've written now uh, a novel that we're going to talk about, uh, but let's let's lay uh, some groundwork, give you some credibility. Uh, who, who is Mike Papantonio, everybody? Big time. Uh, lawyer, and uh, what kind of law do you practice? You got you got some. Strong, you're, you're a very respected lawyer. Obviously, some people probably hate you and, and are terrified <laughs> of you, Mike. I, I'm one well, of them, by the way. I've always been <clears throat> intimidated by. It. I listen to you on the radio. I'm like, I would never. Luckily, I'm on generally the same side of issues as you. But I'm like, I would never want to argue with that guy. But what what what, what kind of lawyer are you? Well, most you know the the cases I try aren't. They're not auto cases. They're cases against Dupont, Pfizer, Merck, some of the biggest corporations in the world. And it, it's complex. It's called complex litigation. Most of the time, they end up being pharmaceutical cases or big environmental cases. And that's what I've been doing for about 35 years. Everybody has their niche that they fall into. Um, what it, I think my politics mixes well with what I do as a lawyer, and that is you have to push back. Corporate media doesn't push back. The government is incapable of pushing back. And so sometimes the only pushback there is is a, a few angry lawyers that want to want to expose some of the, the things that happen in this country that corporate media would never tell us about. So some people would refer to you as uh, as a guy who does uh, mass tort or tort law. You you get these big uh, re- returns uh, when you go after, say, a pharmaceutical company. Is that pejorative? Are you proud of of, of the type of uh, law that you practice going after? And and how much how much do you? I mean, you get some big money for your clients, I would imagine. Some of these cases. Let, let me give you the best example I can, Pete. First of all, this is not class action law. This is simply where you have a drug that might be killing a thousand people a year. The best example I can give you is Yaz. Yaz was a drug that was, um, it was killing, uh, birth control pill, and it was killing women by the hundreds all over America. So when we found out about it, we went to the major networks and we said, listen, you got to tell this story because if you don't tell the story, more women are going to die. And sure enough, they wouldn't tell the story because one of their big advertisers was, uh, was, Pfizer, was a bear. So they refused to tell the story. And in, in effect, during the time that they let that go, hundreds of women became crippled or, or died because of Yaz, which is simply a birth control pill. So I, you ask, is it rewarding? <clears throat> it is rewarding when you, have, when you shut that down, when you say to Bear, look, we're going to be at you for the rest of our lives if we have to, but we want some changes made. And there's, no, there's nobody else, Pete, that will do that. Government, uh, bas- most of the time you have government so tied in to a, a corporation like Pfizer or DuPont or Dow Chemical. They're so tied in because of, of money issues. Uh, you know, these are the people that give the DNC, for example. Let me, let me ask you about that. Sorry to interrupt you, Mike, but I saw this this morning in, in the political playbook. Um, the main lobbying group of pharmaceutical companies is called Pharma, P-H-R-M-A. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I read this morning, they're, they're going to be forking over an additional $100 million in dues as the industry gears up for a post-election battle over drug prices. The move would boost the group's already substantial coffers, bringing its budget to more than $300 million. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Pharmaceutical companies that might actually be in competition, they collude and they throw money into a pot, hiring um, companies that actually have lawyers, lobbyists, rather, working for them in the D.C., Virginia area. They go uh, to the federal and state government, and they lobby for laws and regulations that are favorable to their industry. Is, that's how it works with a number of industries, but specifically on pharma. What do they do with all of this money? Most of it goes to politicians. The other part goes to um, goes to the media. If you watch the nightly news, on the average, <clears throat> Pete, you're going to see seven pharmaceutical advertisements. So let's say you have a drug out there killing somebody, and you call the NBC. And uh, understand, I used to actually be a uh, I, I would be a uh, I appeared on MSNBC all the time. I appeared on Fox. I appeared on MSNBC, CNN, right down the line. But when I would try to tell a story, when I tried to say, look, this is an important story, some cat on the 50th floor with an abacus would say, no, we can't do that because this is a big advertiser and they won't come back. So Pharma, the organization you're talking about, they further that, Pete. They meet with the, they meet with the, uh, uh, the executives at NBC or ABC. They sit down and they say, listen, we'd really like to give you another $20 million in the next few months. Uh, what do you think about this? 
this. It's the same thing they do with newspapers. The newspapers have these editorial boards. Well, pharma will be there on any big issue, meeting with the pharmaceutical board, <clears throat> just like they're a politician. But what see, what we think is we think things are going to take care of themselves. We think there's some silver bullet that's going to, you know, it's going to change all that. That when, when a pharmaceutical company does wrong or an oil and gas company fracks us out of existence, that somehow regulators are going to take care of that, that it's built in for justice, anything but the truth. You know, what Donald Trump is using, has, has always used uh, uh, lawsuits and, and legal threats to get what he has wanted. Um, you're a lawyer. You understand that intimately, how it works. H how, how do you look at what, how Donald Trump has conducted business in terms of how he has used his, yeah. his high-powered, high-paid uh, lawyers for him to get what he wants. Here's the quick answer. Corporate America hates lawsuits. They, that's what tort reform is about. That is, tell the average person they're not permitted to go to a courtroom. But where it comes to my corporation suing your corporation, right. we need to be, it needs to be unfettered. We need to have a welcome wagon where it comes to those kinds of lawsuits. Donald Trump is exhibit A for that. You see, he, they don't want the, the guy who's blinded by a product to go to court and, and, and have a, a fair trial. They don't want uh, when you've lost a child because of a bad medication, they don't want that family to go to court. But they do want the person, the, the corporation that might have caused that injury to be able to sue another corporation for something like a merger acquisition issue. What do you say to people, given um, your legal practice and your career, what do you say to people say, you know what, my issue is with we need, we need tort reform, and if we have tort reform, that'll bring down the cost of, of health insurance. If we have tort reform, that'll... I don't know what else that is. Yeah, they say. every every what? day, Pete, somebody comes to my oh, yeah. comes into our office. They they thought tort reform was wonderful. They voted Republican. They they thought they were conservatives, and then they've lost a husband or a child because of a defective product and or medic maybe medical malpractice. We have to tell them we would love to help you, but the law on that issue is so bad because it was changed during the time that you were Republican, during the time that you were conservative, <laughs> during a time when you thought that the end all was to yeah. tort reform. Because they're always, they're convinced, correct me if I'm wrong, they're convinced by what they see in the news or they hear about as some really, really fraudulent, yes. uh, over, you know, wrought, faked, um, you know, the hot coffee, which, by the way, is a, an amazing documentary. You Isn't know, the, it, yeah. the hot coffee burns a lady at McDonald's and somebody gets millions of dollars. That's a very... A convincing kind of anecdote, right, Mike? Right. Well, there's something there's something called the reptilian mind. When you're a trial lawyer, you have to be very aware of it, and that is that the jury there is responding to what is it that is going to be best for them. They'll be if there's 12 jurors, they don't even care about the other 11. What is best for me? I'm going to vote in a way that's best for me. Mm. So what the other side can what the other side convinced that one juror of is, gee whiz, if you vote to be able to give this poor woman who was not just mildly burned, horribly burned by something was totally avoidable, then uh, then if you do that, then your your Big Mac is going to be more expensive. You know, Big Mac falafel is going to be a lot more expensive. For you. <laughs> Big Mac falafel. If, if that's actually a new menu item at McDonald's, I might go.